we started at QTech uh, a new kind of seminar. It's called QTech 360, uh, where we have uh, really great updates uh, from different researchers, PIs, uh, and so forth. Uh, and it's really a great pleasure to start with Sridhar Paswami with the first QTech 360 seminar. Uh, let me also, I, I'm sure you all know Sridhar, but also let me try to give a brief introduction to uh, Sridhar Goswami. And, and it's really remarkable that he has a very long standing history in, in semiconducting systems, uh, starting as a student in the group of Mark Erickson in the University of Wisconsin, a PhD in a group of Michael Pepper, Cam Cambridge University, then a postdoc in Arendam Ghosh uh, group in Indian Institute of Science, then a postdoc in a group of Lieven van der Seypen, uh, and doing that, he covered gallium arsenide, silicon, van der Waals materials, graphene, complex oxide, and, and perhaps I'm, I'm uh, forgetting many more material systems that he already studied. And with that as a basis, he uh, started at QTEC now as a group leader, doing some very excited research. Uh, and I believe one of the main goals is to study topological phase transitions. And, and with that, it's also the title of this presentation is to study two-dimensional platforms for topological superconductivity. And with that, it's really a great pleasure to start with the first Q360 seminar, Srijit Goswami. Uh, if you're ready, please start. Great. Uh, thanks, Menno. Uh, I think uh, maybe let me start off by saying that I think uh, it's a really great initiative. Uh, I know we discussed a little bit the idea about doing this and how uh, it would be received. I hope it will be received well because uh, as QTech is, you know, getting bigger and bigger, uh, hopefully this gives more of a glimpse, at least to everybody working here, what, you know, your colleagues are doing. Um, okay, so with that, uh, uh, let me get started. So uh, today I want to talk um, about uh, two-dimensional platforms for topological superconductivity. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, in the Qubit Research Division uh, doing experimental work. And um, essentially what I would like to go through today is, uh, you know, why are we particularly interested in these two dimensional systems? What kind of advantages they have? And give you an idea about where we stand in terms of our efforts to uh, realize topological superconductivity in these systems. Okay. Um, so to uh, give you a brief outline, so I, I will give a short introduction to Majorana's, uh, just enough, hopefully, for you to uh, you know, appreciate some of the results that we have and why they are potentially important in our endeavor to create and study Majorana's. Um, why uh, are we interested in 2D platforms? And in particular, I will uh, focus on two things, uh, which is, um, possible ways to engineer topological superconductivity in what are called Josephson junctions. And uh, this is, um, and, and the second part is thinking about uh, developing new hybrid materials, uh, because in especially, I think it's true in uh, almost all condensed matter experimental field that uh, the development of materials really can produce uh, you know, quantum jumps in, 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 uh, in, in the scientific research. So I'll talk a little bit about new kinds of hybrid materials that we have been uh, working with. And finally, if I have time, I will briefly tell you about um, stuff which will not be covered here, but basically some perhaps a little bit unconventional methods to try and uh, uh, realize topological superconductivity. Okay, with that, let me get started. Um, so um, uh, what we're interested in are these so-called Majorana zero modes. And as a brief introduction, in principle, you should be able to engineer them if you have a combination of these three things. So you have uh, superconductivity, you have a semiconducting material with a large spin orbit coupling, and you have a Zeeman field, a magnetic field. And perhaps a picture that many of you have seen before uh, is one of um, a one dimensional nanowire, uh, which is coupled to a superconductor. And what you see here are little gates that allow you to control the 
properties of this hybrid system locally. Uh, and the idea is that you apply a magnetic field. And uh, at some point, you would expect to see these uh, localized Majoranas. Now, in the sort of uh, context of quantum computing and topological quantum computing, uh, these uh, Majoranas are expected to have some very fundamental properties, which, which make them appealing for uh, topological quantum computing. Uh, well, one of the things is that they, they come in pairs and the separation between these pairs uh, is basically what determines uh, uh, the protection, their topological protection. So how long lived, if you were to make a qubit out of it, how long lived it would be. And this actually grows exponentially with uh, the separation between these Majoranas. Uh, finally, if you want to do uh, gate operations, you basically exploit the fact that these Majorana zero modes have uh, a non-abelian exchange statistics, and this is what allow, would allow you to do uh, topologically protected operations. Um, so uh, to maybe go into a little more, because you will be seeing a lot of device images and pictures uh, to give you a sense for uh, what the important uh, parameters are and how one actually tunes this system into a, or would want to tune this system into a topological phase. This is another schematic where you see this wire and basically these gates with a superconductor that proximitizes or induces superconductivity into the semiconductor. Uh, and there are two uh, important parameters. One is the chemical potential. So these gates are actually precisely used to tune the chemical potential in this wire. Uh, and the other is the Zeeman energy. So this is the magnetic field tunes the Zeeman energy. And what you see here is a, albeit very simplified, but uh, uh, a sort of ideal phase diagram that you would expect for an ideal system. Uh, and what you see here is that as you, for a certain chemical potential, as you increase uh, the Zeeman field, you go from a non-topological region to a topological region. Uh, so what, what do you actually need in your, in your material system to be able to do that? Uh, well, first thing is that you would of course want uh, a Zeeman energy, which means that you have to apply a magnetic field. And ideally what you would like is, spin orbit, uh, is uh, semiconductor materials which have a large G factor. This is simply because this allows you to enter this topological phase at much lower magnetic fields, uh, which make it compatible with superconductivity. Uh, the second important parameter, which we will also be talking about a bit more is, is this strong spin orbit coupling. And this is actually one of the uh, important uh, properties that determines how well these Majoranas are localized. So it uh, can be quantified by what is called this localization length. And it basically scales inversely as this parameter alpha, which uh, characterizes the spin orbit length. And you can imagine that what you ideally want uh, is uh, the overlap between these wave functions of the two Majoranas to be as small as possible. And this then gives you this, this uh, strong protection. Uh, so in terms of the kind of materials you would like to look at, uh, you, you're looking for materials or hybrid systems which have a large G factor, a strong spin orbit coupling. And uh, there is another important element here, which is that over the years, people have basically realized that the interface between this superconductor and semiconductor is very crucial. Uh, so it's very important to have very clean interfaces uh, between these two. This is an example of um, uh, an interface between indium arsenide, which is a semiconductor and aluminum. And what you basically see in this uh, transmission electron microscopy image is that you can indeed make extremely clean interfaces between these two now. Okay, so that's uh, uh, just a bit about what the requirements are, the main requirements. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, also to give you an idea about what a typical measurement would look like, if you're trying to measure these, uh, these Majoranas, uh, it's again another schematic here of what you see here is now a nanowire, uh, which is coupled to a superconductor. So this, is, this would be the superconductor. 
these gates basically create a tunnel barrier here, which allows you to do a local density of states measurement. And this is a gate that tunes the chemical potential. So that's the other parameter that we need to be able to tune. And this is just a schematic of what we do. We apply a voltage and uh, try to measure the local density of states at this point here. And a typical measurement might look like this. So now the voltage axis is basically proportional to energy. Uh, and these are there would be several plots uh, for increasing magnetic fields. And what you expect to see is that at some critical field, when you have your topological phase transition, uh, you start to see a state at zero energy. Uh, so at low magnetic fields, you don't see anything because this is what a superconducting density of states looks like, it's gapped. And then at, at finite magnetic field, when you have a topological transition, you expect to see this. Uh, so these are, these are of course typical measurements. Now I will, uh, this talk is not dedicated to all the uh, caveats of this. Uh, we all know that uh, seeing something like this is uh, uh, actually not sufficient for sure, but may not even be necessary. Uh, but, uh, but this is, you know, one of the typical measurements that one does to probe the local, local density of states. Okay, um, so <clears throat> just to give you a sense for you know, what are some of these, you know, we, there's a lot of research that is basically on fundamental or mesoscopic superconductivity uh, that happens uh, in this field. Uh, and uh, what are some of the very simple but important questions that are, that are outstanding? Uh, one is that, uh, you know, are these Majoranas, it's the most, the simplest question, which is the first one is that, are these Majoranas really localized at the end? So, if I had this system and I were able to do this kind of local density of states measurements here and here, well, firstly, would I see these two appear under exactly the same conditions? And secondly, can I be sure that there is absolutely zero density of states or absolutely nothing here? Because as you remember, the wave function should decay. Uh, secondly, is you know, are these are these uh, are these Majoranas actually correlated? Uh, which is what you need in order to uh, create a, a topological qubit. Uh, the other interesting question is that are there other architectures that move beyond this kind of nanowire picture, right? So, you know, can we, are there other ways to create Majoranas which do not uh, use nanowires? Uh, and one example that I will actually be talking about are uh, things called Josephson junctions. So Josephson junction is in some ways a dual of this. So you have two superconductors with a semiconductor in the middle. Uh, and uh, you have this superconducting loop. And the idea here is that you can in principle control the appearance or uh, destruction of these Majoralas through a small amount of magnetic field that tunes the phase difference between these Josephson junctions. So, I, I mean, there are of course many outstanding questions, but uh, I cite these two in particular because uh, these, are, these are some questions that we are trying to address uh, at this very moment. <clears throat> okay, uh, so um, the other thing to think about is that this is really further down the line but uh, if one wants to uh, actually try to build up a qubit based on Majorana, so let's assume that, you know, uh, there is no doubt that these things are topologically protected and we want to now start making qubits, uh, it's actually quite complex. So what you see here is uh, one of the schemes to create a Majorana qubit. Uh, and what you need without going into too many details is firstly, you need, a whole lot of these one dimensional systems which are perfectly aligned. Uh, and you also need auxiliary elements uh, which basically allow you to perform measurements and read out the state of the qubit and manipulate the qubit. And these come in different forms. Uh, it consists of uh, things like quantum dots uh, which can be used as you know, parity detectors 
or just simple semiconducting phase coherent arms to do interferometric, interferometric measurements. But the point is that uh, the idea here is just to show that uh, going from understanding the fundamental properties of Majoranas to, to building up qubits uh, requires a platform which is clearly different from uh, uh, just uh, single nanowires. And, and this brings me to the motivation for what we do in my group is uh, the idea here is that can we, instead of starting with 1D systems, can we start with 2D systems? So this is an example of a, what's called the 2D electron gas. So the, there are electrons which reside um, at the interface between two semiconductors. I will talk about the materials more later, uh, which uh, can in principle be coupled to another superconductor. Um, so the, the idea here is that it can be start off with something like this and then basically do things top down and then try to create uh, in the future scalable systems. But in the shorter term, uh, what it actually, what is very interesting is that it provides you a lot of design flexibility. And you will see as we go through the talk, the different kinds of devices that can actually be realized, uh, not just to look for new ways of engineering Majoranas, but also look at new ways to possibly probe them. Um, uh, so this is uh, really the motivation to work with 2D electron systems. Uh, and of course, 2 eggs are not new. Uh, I mean, they're used, for example, in spin qubits all the time, but in the context of topological superconductivity, there are a few that have, uh, uh, that have been used quite a bit. Uh, the first is the mercury telluride. So this is, Supposed to be a, 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 a um, and the people have indeed done measurements on mercury telluride. Uh, one of the most popular systems is actually indium arsenide, and the reason for that is that it is actually very easy to grow, or I should say, relatively easy. I'm not a grower, so I don't want to underestimate this. Uh, relatively easy to uh, grow aluminum on these indium arsenide 2 decks. So what you see here is again a TM image where you can grow aluminum in a 2D plane on uh, indium arsenide 2D electron gases. Uh, and it's relatively easy to do this. And this superconductor actually couples very well to this indium arsenide. Um, our motivation uh, is actually to look at uh, a slightly different material, uh, which is called indium antimonide. And the main motivation for this is uh, that you can basically have uh, a much, much larger G factor. So it's almost two or three times what you would get in indium arsenide. And uh, this has implications for the magnetic field required to enter the topological region. In addition, uh, I mean, it also has somewhat, could have somewhat higher mobilities and spin orbit interaction. But the main idea is that you uh, can try to exploit this, this larger G factor. And actually, uh, I mean, when we started some of this research about three years ago, uh, very little was done on indium antimonide. Uh, so uh, the first things that we actually established were, let's look at this semiconductor. So let's forget about the superconductor and let's look at the semiconductor and see whether it has, uh, at least in principle, uh, some of the basic requirements that uh, that, uh, uh, that one needs to enter a topological regime. And some of these are uh, outlined here is that uh, you have a large mean free paths, which can go up to uh, a few microns. Uh, 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 again, a spin orbit interaction, which is also relatively large. This is again related to the localization of the Majoranas. And you have a long phase coherence length. So if you want to eventually make uh, these kinds of uh, interferometric devices uh, for qubits, then uh, this uh, should be possible. And when we started this work, uh, while all of this is very nice, uh, there were no uh, reports of induced superconductivity. So the first thing that I want to talk about is basically induced superconductivity in uh, indium antimonide 2 decks. And the kind of device I will be talking about is a very simple device. Um, oh, sorry. And it's basically a Josephson junction. So we have a superconductor that connects this indium antimonide quantum well to form what is called a Josephson junction. Um, and the 
question is, of course, why do we want to study Jodison junctions? I was I already hinted at the fact that they are an interesting uh, platform uh, to realize uh, topological superconductivity. What you see here is a sketch of a Josephson junction. So you have two superconductors. Uh, and the idea is when you apply a magnetic field in this direction, you expect to form Majoranas here. Um, the nice thing about these junctions is that in principle, uh, what you can do is when you apply a magnetic field, so you see the Zeeman energy on this axis, you can actually enter uh, what is called a self-tuned topological phase. So you don't have to do any fine tuning, for example, of your chemical potential. Uh, and this is what is represented here. So let me quickly tell you what this plot means. Uh, essentially what you have, this diamond represents, uh, represents uh, the region which is topological. And uh, what you see here is the phase difference across the superconductor. And essentially what happens is that as you start increasing your magnetic field, you expect to actually jump into this topological regime at some critical magnetic field. And this magnetic field is, uh, is, is basically, uh, and this transition, one of the indicators of this is that if you look at the critical current across this junction, uh, you expect it to be non-monotonic. I'll talk about this more later. Uh, the other interesting thing is that you can, of course, impose a phase difference across the junction. So, for example, by making a loop. And what you then expect is, again, you see these diamonds, which are topologically protected, uh, that now, contrary to the phase diagram you saw earlier for these wires, uh, you can see that if I tune my phase difference here to precisely pi, I can actually enter the topological regime at arbitrarily, in principle, arbitrarily small uh, magnetic fields. And this, this, this could be a real benefit to engineer Majoranas. Uh, furthermore, the phase actually gives me a knob. So if I want to go in and out of the topological phase, it, I can do it by just applying small magnetic fields that control the flux across a loop here. Okay, let me, let me skip this uh, and, and move on. So this, is, this was really the motivation for us to make these Josephson junctions. Uh, just to tell you again what the device looks like, uh, Again, we contacted basically now externally with the superconductor and uh, look at the transport properties through this Josephson junction as a function of a gate voltage which tunes the density here. Uh, these are some basic checks. You can apply small magnetic fields and you see a typical interference pattern in a Josephson junction. This is called a Fraunhofer interference pattern and uh, basic checks to show that you can actually tune uh, the supercurrent uh, using the gate. So for those who are not familiar with plots like this, just to quickly tell you that these dark regions indicate superconductivity because the differential resistance is zero and the light regions here indicate that you have switched out of your superconducting branch. Um, okay, since these were the first Josephson junctions in this system, yeah, we needed to do these simple checks. Uh, what we also did was we made arrays of junctions to test basically what is the quality, the device quality in terms of uh, mobilities of these Josephson junctions. And uh, you can essentially measure the critical current of the junction. So the, jun the point at which it goes out of this zero resistance state and do this for several lengths. And there have for a long time been some predictions that depending on whether you are in the ballistic or diffusive regime, this product of the critical current and the slope here, which is the normal state resistance, should follow a very specific scaling. Uh, and what you see in this plot is that uh, indeed we see for our highest quality samples that it follows this one over L scaling of this, this product Whereas for the lower mobility samples, it follows a one over L square, which is indicative of diffusive. Uh, but this is essentially just to indicate that the quality of these hybrids in terms of the, uh, the, the mean free path, so the disorder landscape and uh, uh, um, is, is very good. Okay, so what, 
I mean, but we are, we are, these are some preliminary checks, of course. And what we are interested in is actually what are referred to. I, 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 I showed you these pi junctions. So when you apply a magnetic field, you can actually jump into what is called this pi phase. Uh, and uh, these are some measurements actually that were done on mercury telluride. So let me just tell you what's happening in this graph. Uh, here, blue means superconducting uh, and yellow means not superconducting. So what you basically see is that if you take a Josephson junction, like the one I showed you with large spin orbit coupling, uh, and uh, you apply a magnetic field, what you expect, this is not surprising, is that your superconductivity will die at some point. So here you see that the superconductivity dies. But what is interesting is that after a certain point, it comes back up again. And uh, this is what, is what is referred to as this zero to pi transition, which recently has been associated with the topological phase transition in high spin orbit materials. Uh, and uh, if you go through the math of exactly where this transition should happen, it's surprisingly simple. Uh, the upshot is basically that the field at which this should happen, it's dependent on the density, number of electrons in your 2D electron gas, uh, the g-factor, the effective mass, and the length, the dimension of the junction. Um, so we actually, uh, you know, motivated by these proposals to engineer topological superconductivity in junctions. These were experiments that we, we the first experiments that we did. Uh, again, here is your device. And what you see here is the supercurrent that travels through this Josephson junction which is an indication of the induced superconductivity as a function of magnetic field, which is applied in the plane. And what you clearly see is that, you know, your supercurrent goes down as a function of magnetic field, as you would expect. But then surprisingly, it, it, it recovers. And then it goes through a bunch of these oscillations, which basically go through this zero and pi transitions. Uh, and as a sanity check, we can do this for different lengths. Remember that, that there's a simple inverse scaling with lengths. So we made junctions of different lengths and tested where this transition happens. And it indeed follows this, this one over L scaling uh, very well. Um, of course, we have a number of knobs here that we can tune. Uh, the most obvious one is density. That's why we have this, 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 this uh, gate here. Uh, and when we do that, uh, we actually already see, so if you just take one junction and you apply gate voltages, that means you're reducing the density at more negative gate voltages, you can see that where this transition happens actually shifts. Um, so one can be actually more, more quantitative about this, and we can do a, a measurement in a slightly different way, uh, which is that let us fix the magnetic field. And now let us vary the gate voltage, which you know, tunes uh, the electron density. And typically what you would expect in a Josephson junction, remember the black parts indicate superconductivity, is that as you reduce the density, you basically reduce uh, the number of carriers. So you expect that the efficiency with which you carry supercurrent reduces. Uh, so you basically expect this to monotonically go down and die out at some point. Uh, but as we start increasing the magnetic field, what you can clearly see is that it, it dies out, but then it comes back up. Uh, and as you increase the field further and further, uh, it actually moves in position, which is, which is again, completely in line with the fact that you can actually tune this transition uh, by changing your density. Uh, to be more quantitative, we can actually plot. We do this measurement for several uh, configurations, and we can basically plot this out in a picture like this, where on the y-axis, you see uh, the Zeeman energy or the magnetic field, which is related to the Zeeman energy, and the other important energy scale, which is the Thaulis energy, which uh, is determined by the density. And again, you see this extremely simple expression that it should follow. Uh, and we see that it indeed does, because we actually measure all of these parameters independently and determine the g-factor from here. Uh, so the details uh, are, are, are not so important, but I think what I really like about this work is that 
it allows us to construct a very clear phase diagram between uh, these two regions. So what is the zero phase, which uh, in an ideal scenario you expect to be your trivial phase uh, and the pi phase, which uh, you expect to be topological. Uh, of course, these measurements in themselves do not uh, prove that there is anything topological in our systems. Uh, one has to do things like measuring the density of states or even more advanced experiments to definitively say that there is topological superconductivity, but it is a starting point that tells us uh, how to construct these phase diagrams and where to look for, uh, for Majoranas uh, in the future. Okay, um, so with this, uh, I want to move on um, uh, to the next question, which is, uh, you know, I, I stressed early on that, you know, having good interfaces between the superconductor and the semiconductor are, are extremely crucial. Uh, and uh, uh, the question is, uh, can we, and you know, these, these devices that we had made were actually, let's say a bit by brute force where we, you know, damage the semiconductor and put some superconductor on it. So the question is, can we actually make these pristine interfaces uh, between the semiconductor and superconductor, uh, you know, to have uh, cleaner devices? So uh, we have been looking, we spent quite some time thinking that, you know, these, these, these indium antimonide wells look so great. Why don't we just put some aluminum and uh, see whether there is an induced superconductivity? Unfortunately, the answer was no. Uh, the next idea was, okay, why don't we just make this barrier thinner and thinner to more efficiently couple this aluminum to the indium antimonide? Maybe then we get induced superconductivity, but it didn't work. We actually then said, okay, forget about all this. Let's actually put aluminum right on the indium antimonide. And unfortunately, even these did not show us any superconductivity. I don't want to go into the possible reasons for this, but uh, we believe that it has to do with the specific material properties of indium antimonide and aluminum, where essentially, um, uh, depending on what semiconductor you have, uh, the interface states here can be, can be very different. So for example, in something like indium arsenide, it's very easy to accumulate carriers at this interface in indium antimonide, uh, it's believed to be harder. Um, okay, so so how does one actually get around this? So what you know, can we still? I mean, we were interested in indium antimonide because of its uh, large G factor. Can we get around this uh, and have uh, you know clean interfaces, large spin orbit coupling, and yet this large G factor? Uh, and this actually motivated us to look into these compounds, which are which are called ternary uh, materials. So these are uh, basically not, not, not pure indium arsenide or pure indium antimonide. Uh, so these are called ternary materials where you have some concentration of antimony and some concentration of arsenic. Um, and what this basically allows is that incorporating the small amount of arsenic actually change the semiconductor band structure precisely in such a way that it allows you to uh, induce uh, superconductivity into your system. Um, and uh, as a bonus, actually these, uh, these compounds in fact have significantly larger spin orbit coupling than either indium arsenide or indium antimonide. Um, so to uh, basically verify this, we actually studied this in, in some more detail. Uh, let, me, let me skip these measurements, these are basically uh, a way. So what you see here is the resistance versus magnetic field. Essentially, it allows you to extract uh, what is known as alpha, uh, which is uh, your spin orbit parameter. So the larger it is, the better it is. <clears throat> uh, and what we do is that we do this for uh, different uh, concentrations of arsenic. So on this plot, uh, you basically see what uh, this spin orbit coupling is as a function of uh, a gate voltage that we apply in our devices. And the first thing you notice is that as you increase the arsenic concentration, uh, you know, the spin orbit parameter increases significantly by at least a factor of four. So here you see pure indium antimonide, and here you see uh, uh, this uh, indium arsenide antimonide with a, with, a, with a concentration of about 22%. Uh, 
So it increases by a significant amount. Uh, if you compare this with typical numbers in indium arsenide 2 decks, this is also significantly larger. So that is good news. Um, we also measured, this was actually done in collaboration with uh, Giordano Scapucci's group. So thanks to Giordano and Mario. Uh, we, what we're interested in also the G factor and we actually found that the G factor, at least in the perpendicular direction was actually comparable to that of indium antimonide. So uh, it already was very promising. And we see that you know, with this material, you can get extremely large spin orbit couplings while maintaining uh, the large G factor of indium antimonide, which was attractive in the first place. Uh, and now the question is, of course, what happens to the induced superconductivity? Uh, to measure this, uh, we make devices, again, which are Josephson junctions. So what you see here is the aluminum plus semiconductor, and these regions are where the aluminum has been removed. So this forms an S and S Josephson junction, after which we put gates on it to tune the junction, basically. Um, and uh, when we did these measurements, we didn't know whether you would have induced superconductivity or not. And the first simple checks are, again, do you see uh, a supercurrent. And these are similar measurements that I showed you before in indium antimonide, uh, is that you indeed see induced superconductivity. You can control it with your gate basic checks. Um, you can also do some uh, measurements as a function of voltage bias. Uh, again, the details are not so important. These are multiple Andre reflections. But what it essentially allows you to do is it allows you to estimate the size of this induced gap. So I have a parent superconductor and a semiconductor here. So what is the size of the induced gap inside this semiconductor? And this actually indirectly tells you something about the transparency between uh, at this interface. Uh, so what we find is, uh, I didn't put it here, but we find what we find is that the induced gap is actually quite close to the gap of the parent superconductor. So we indeed can make extremely transparent Josephson junction, which means that the coupling between our superconductor and semiconductor is good. Um, uh, finally, I mean, this in itself is, is, is not enough. What you actually would like to do is you would like to actually measure the density of states in this hybrid system directly. And in order to do this, uh, it's actually fairly simple. You have these top gates, uh, which are split gates, which control the electrostatic profile here. And if, basically, if you zoom in here, you can see that you can create a tunnel barrier here. So the idea is do, that you do a tunnel spectroscopy measurement, and this will tell you what the density of states is uh, in this proximitized region. Uh, and uh, the, this is a typical measurement where you tune this split gate voltage. So you go from an open regime to a tunnel barrier as you decrease this gate voltage. Uh, and uh, you see that at small biases, uh, the conduction is completely suppressed and then it increases at higher biases. And a typical line cut looks like this. So this is what a typical spectroscopy measurement in our devices looks like. Uh, what is important to note here uh, and this is important in the context of, of Majorana's where you are actually trying to look for states near zero energy. You have to be very sure that, you know, when you start off with your trivial system, you don't have any of these states. Uh, and this is one of the important checks that one needs to do for any new kind of platform is whether indeed this conductance below the superconducting gap is, is small. Uh, and we see that it's actually few orders of magnitude smaller than the conductance outside of the gap. Okay, so, so this is all well and good. Uh, I, and uh, we are actually very excited. So I think for the past year and a half or, or so, we've been working on this new material system. To, to summarize, basically, uh, it seems to have all the, at least in my opinion, all the attractive properties of indium arsenide and indium antimonide in one material. Uh, and I think that it's a very promising platform to, to, to go ahead on. Um, and uh, I wanted to very briefly show you some of the things that we are doing currently. So we are, you know, we've moved from the stage where 
we sort of established the material parameters and now we're trying to do more uh, uh, direct experiments related to uh, Majorana's and topological superconductivity. Uh, the first approach is um, uh, what are called these phase bias junctions. So what you see here is a superconducting quantum interference device, a squid uh, with two Josephson junctions. Uh, and uh, this is before we put any gates. Uh, after we put our gates, this is what it looks like. Uh, and the idea is basically we want to do a tunnel spectroscopy locally here uh, to check whether you know we have Majoranas or not, or at least zero bias peaks or not. Uh, and some of uh, the, our preliminary measurements are just doing precisely this kind of spectroscopy. So again, this is a local density of states measurements as a function of magnetic field that tunes the flux through here. And uh, uh, what you see is that uh, this indeed modulates. And this is what you would expect is that uh, you have these Andreev bound states, uh, which are basically carry the supercurrent and these are flux dependent. So these should indeed oscillate with magnetic field. And of course, again, we see that uh, when you do this spectroscopy, the density of states inside the gap is again, uh, very small. <clears throat> Um, another approach which uh, connects back to uh, ideas for making, uh, let's say, qubit uh, devices in the future is that uh, we've been working with superconducting islands. So these are just isolated. These are basically just elongated quantum dots, superconducting quantum dots, uh, and where we basically have gates to control the tunnel barrier and the, and the, and the, uh, and the chemical potential. Uh, and uh, what, we, what we see here is uh, represented in this stability plot. Uh, and this is what you would expect for a superconducting island. So you see high conductance at a certain gate periodicity, which is depicted here in these lines. Uh, but if you go at, to large energies, so large biases, uh, what you see is that this period becomes double. And the idea here is essentially that when you have low biases below your superconducting gap, uh, you can only transport 2E charge. So these are called 2E periodic oscillations. And when you go above this energy scale, now you can basically have single electron transport uh, and uh, you have 1E oscillations. So these are again some uh, simple checks to, to just uh, to see whether our devices actually uh, work the way we expect them, because I think these are all important things to establish whenever you have a new material platform. Uh, finally, uh, we've also been looking at uh, what are called, these are more, let's say, uh, quasi one dimensional systems. So here you see this long nanowire like structure. So this is aluminum, but it is now not isolated from the other lead, but it's just connected to the other lead. And again, we try to do spectroscopy from here, and this controls the tunnel barrier. Uh, and uh, with these uh, devices, we basically wanted to also see what happens when you turn on a uh, large magnetic field. So these are you know, very fresh results, uh, but as a function of magnetic field, uh, what you see is that you, know, you expect your gap to get suppressed. It indeed does. Uh, and we see that there are these Andre bound states that come together. Uh, they form what looks like a zero bias peak. I don't want to go into any interpretations for this, but I just want to show this as uh, uh, a basically proof of concept that these devices on these new material platforms uh, actually seem to have all the important ingredients that one would like to uh, engineer topological superconductivity. Okay, um, so with this, I would just like to very briefly uh, tell you just two other directions that we are uh, have recently started looking at, um, which are a little bit out of the box. Uh, and I don't have time to go into them in detail, but if you're interested, please get in touch with me. Uh, is uh, one of the ideas is we have these 2D platform. Can we actually use the quantum Hall effect? The point is that quantum Hall channels are transport channels, which in themselves are topologically protected. 
So can we couple these channels to superconductors and actually then get away from all these problems that one would have with variations in chemical potential and disorder and things like that, uh, and actually use these to create Majoranas. And the idea is depicted here. So if you have a superconducting strip with some quantum Hall channels, uh, you would expect in theory to form Majoranas at the edges. Um, this is work which is in progress. This is what a typical device looks like. And the idea is that can we, in this finger, actually form Majoranas at the end. Uh, and to finally end, there is something completely different which has nothing to do with any of the semiconductors. Uh, we are also looking at uh, possibilities of using some completely different materials and architecture. So in this case, graphene as a topological superconductor. The big advantage of graphene is that it is actually cleaner in, than any of the material systems I've spoken about. Uh, so in terms of disorder, it is extremely low. Uh, that is one of the big advantages. The disadvantage is that it has no spin orbit coupling, but there are some ideas of doing some clever uh, heterostructures of graphene by sandwiching it between different materials. Uh, and there you can actually expect to have a topological phase transition. And what we see, these are measurements uh, in my lab, is as we change the electric field across the graphene, what you see is that you have a region which has a large resistance. The resistance goes to something very small, but then comes back up. And uh, this is actually the first indications of a topological phase transition in these graphene systems. This is something that we are uh, working on right now to see what exactly happens or if something interesting happens when you couple this phase transition uh, with superconductors. Okay, so with this, uh, let me let me stop. I just want to briefly say that I think uh, hopefully I've put across the point that you know two D platforms are extremely versatile uh, to explore different realizations of topological superconductivity. This is I think very crucial, especially in this field because uh, you know there's it's still an open question. Uh, you know, what is precisely the right way to approach uh, the engineering of Majoranas and eventually topological qubits. Um, from, um, as it's extremely flexible. So, you know, you, you have the opportunity to make more complex device structures in the future and potentially a promising platform to, to create uh, scalable uh, systems. Okay, so with this, I would like to stop and thank all of our collaborators. I want to in particular mention uh, Mario and Giordano. Uh, they helped us with these G-factor measurements. And of course, a big, big thanks to Purdue University and uh, Mike Manfra's team who grew all of these uh, semiconducting materials. So with this, I'd like to end. And uh, if you have questions, uh, let me know. Thank you, Sujit. Uh, please unmute yourself and give Sujit a big, uh, a big, big applause. I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself. So thank you. Great. Um, beautiful overview and great to see how many semiconductors, uh, study, semiconductors you're still studying. Great insight in your group and also in, in topological supernivity in general. Um, if anyone has a question, um, perhaps just a mute. Oh, I see already one hand from Giordano. Uh, please Thank go you. ahead. Be beautiful. So uh, ca can you go back to the slide with the superconducting island? Because I, somehow I got, I got lost there. Okay. So here on the top image on the left, in yellow, it's actually the part that is superconducting, right? This is correct. This is superconducting, yes. Because your your two deck is below the superconductor, so you just attach away uh, somehow uh, yeah. the superconductor in the tunnel barriers. Yeah. Okay. And then the gates on top uh, just modulate basically the, the the barriers and the plunger gate. Yeah. Is that is that the the device? Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, that was only a clarification because I was confused by by the fact that here actually the superconductor is on top of the of the channel because it, it's uh, it's basically um, 
there's already charge. You don't have to accumulate there. So yeah, you indeed, you don't have to accumulate. And just to mention that all of these two decks actually work in depletion mode. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and of course, I was confused with what I yeah. have in mind, which is the opposite. Yeah. All right, clear. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, very good. Are there other questions? Perhaps just unmute yourself, and whoever shouts the loudest uh, can go first. Yeah. May I ask a question? Yeah, he or she. Thank you for the nice overview. I, I was wondering, you know, the patterning of the 2D system and controlling the, the, the edge defects and contamination is crucial, right? And maybe I missed uh, and maybe explained, but how do you control the cleanness of uh, during patterning? Yeah, indeed. I mean, so this is this is indeed uh, a good question, and uh, you know uh, what makes life actually. Maybe I can show you in this picture itself. What? Uh, well, one of the things that uh, uh, is advantageous, at least in geometries like this, is that uh, the region below the the superconductor is actually protected in itself by the superconductor. So the hybrid system itself remains protected because uh, nothing, nothing can get there. But it's definitely true that this semiconductor region around it uh, cares a lot about the processing. Uh, and uh, one of the, I think, crucial things is actually this tunnel barrier here. So if you have when you're trying to create sharp tunnel barriers, you don't want to have disorder there, you know, to create say accidental quantum dots and things like that, uh, which can indeed sometimes happen. So, um, yeah, so so it definitely is, is something that uh, we are aware of. Uh, we don't know to what extent it is limiting us or will limit us. Um, I should actually point out, uh, there are actually other approaches uh, which are not based on two decks at the moment, but based on nanowires, which are very nice, where they actually have smart ways of creating, uh, this is in, in Leo's group, smart ways of creating uh, structures where you actually don't have to do any processing at all. So you can deposit things at angles with walls in such a way that uh, there is no requirement for any of this processing. Uh, so that could be an interesting option to see if one can adapt those here. But at the moment, uh, this could, could indeed be a concern. Um, do you do special cleaning or treatment? No, we don't do any kind of special treatment, actually. No. Thank you. OK, great. Any further questions? Just to mute. I see Willemine, uh, a hand going up. Yes. Um, thanks, Fidit, for this very nice uh, overview of what you do in your group. Um, so lately, there has been a lot of attention to the um, cleanliness of all the material. Um, and. Uh, and basically a lot of people raise uh, their voices that, that's, that they think that that's what's holding uh, us back in general from seeing really topological features. Um, so in that sense, I feel graphene could be a really uh, nice addition to the field because it's uh, very clean. Um, but I always thought that um, the, um, like graphene itself, of course, it's 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 very it has no defects. But in the fabrication process, of course, there can be some hydrocarbons also on the surface. And I thought that when you put it into in um, uh, uh, stack it with boron nitride, then you have this self cleaning process, uh, which allows you to get uh, ballistic uh, graphene Josephson junctions. But in your um, like and and it's it's very specific actually to this boron nitride flakes, I thought, right? So how does your mobility and how is your, the yeah, what is the quality of your graphene junctions with this extra material that you need in order to get the spin orbit induced? Yeah, so that, so uh, in fact, uh, this, this also works with this material, so tungsten diselenide. So if I remember the numbers correctly, I think, we have got mobilities of a few hundred thousand in these. So this is this is uh, somewhat lower than the boron nitride samples, but uh, not let's say so far so far off. Okay, 
Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Sounds actually very uh, promising in that sense, or very interesting. Well, there are also other problems with it, but yeah. this we can discuss <laughs> later. <laughs> Maybe a question from my side connected to this. So um, on the one hand, you were showing um, in uh, in EMR the money that it has great properties, uh, large G factors, strong spin orbit coupling, everything you can induce over connectivity. And yet you study another material, graphene, and, and uh, I, I see you looking, and Professor, you have another seven conductor already on your mind. Um, but if, if these semiconductors already have these great properties, what's, what's really like the main thing holding back uh, your, your back to go to the topological regime? So is that the, the interface or is there other things that, that you would like to see solved? Yeah, I think it's a combination of several things. So one of the things that uh, Willemine brought up is that, uh, uh, you know, in some ways, there are a lot of uh, conflicting requirements in it in themselves. So you want large mobility, but you also want somehow uh, something that couples very well to the superconductor, which means that you need, cannot have deep quantum wells, for example. Um, so uh, I think one of definitely one of the things that uh, is important is 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 materials materials quality. I mean, this has always been a driver, especially I think for many fields, but definitely here. I think this is definitely one thing that uh, holds us back. The other is, uh, this goes back to, um, you know, one of the advantages, for example, of, of a 2D platform is just even to understand what the limiting factors are, you know, you have to do a lot of measurements, right? And, uh, and, uh, so I think it's it's a combination of these two things that I think are really bottlenecks uh, in in the field. It's the amount that you can measure to real, reliably pinpoint what is going on, in combination with the fact that uh, you know we need significantly higher material quality, which is which is I guess always the case. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Is there a final question? If there's no one else, I'd like to ask a question also about materials. Go ahead. So you mentioned the ternaries, and I think those are very promising also because they're nice to, to fabricate. I was wondering, um, is there a problem with, let's say, different stoichiometries like arsenic and timony concentrations throughout the two deck for the topological phase? Um, yeah, so, so we uh, tried to look at this actually with the TM. It's uh, very difficult to get this information uh, just from from TEM, uh, but one, uh, if I remember correctly, our laboratory do basically did X-ray diffraction, and the X-ray diffraction, the, the the peak basically tells you how you know whether you have something which has a varying lattice constant spatially, or not. Uh, and uh, what we found is that the uh, the sharpness of the peaks, whether you have pure indium and timonite or these ternaries, is 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 unaffected. I see. That's impressive. Yeah. Okay. If you have more questions, uh, you probably know how to find uh, Sajid. Um, and Sajid, thank you again for this beautiful uh, first uh, QTEC 360 seminar. Uh, and let's end again with a big applause for Sajid. And thank you all for coming to this uh, seminar. Yeah.